Now what we'll be doing in, these first, in this first period that we're going to deal with is we are going to just address some issues. We're not going to give any proofs yet. We're not going to give any evidence yet. I'm just going to go through some issues that need to be considered and we will address the issues, then we'll come back to evidence for these issues. But before we do that, I would like to direct your attention to the little piece of paper that has some handwritten notes on it. I just put this together for our benefit. I wrote them out and I'd like to read those little notes from early writings and you have the page numbers from about 43 through 50 through 87 in early writings. I saw that the saints must get a thorough understanding of present truth, which they will be obliged to maintain from the scriptures. Our minds must not be taken up with things around us, but must be occupied with the present truth and a preparation to give a reason of our hope with meekness and fear. Friends, there are a lot of truths in the Bible. You know them, you've been studying them, you've been, at, you've been uh, looking for better ways to present them. But there is something called present truth, which is more important than any other truths of the Bible, not because the truth is more important, but because it applies to the present time. It applies to now. Each age of Earth's history has had a present truth. Noah had present truth. John the Baptist had present truth. And we have present truth for our time today. And notice what she said, that we must get a thorough understanding of present truth, which you can maintain from the scriptures, which you can show from the word of God that this is God's word for this time. The next sent, uh, paragraph says, Satan is now using every device in this sealing time to keep the minds of God's people from the present truth and to cause them to waver. I saw a covering that God was drawing over his people to protect them in the time of trouble. And every soul that was decided on the truth and was pure in heart was to be covered with the covering of the Almighty. Would you agree? that Satan is doing everything that he can to keep his people's minds away from present truth. Any kind of distraction, anything that he can use to kind of pull us away from those crucial things that we need to understand. And would you also want to be sure that you're under the covering that God is drawing over his people? Amen. I don't know about you, but I don't think there is much protection that we can come up with from what Satan is wanting to bring upon us at the end of time. You think you can hide? with the satellites in the sky and all of the other things, unless there is a covering of God, we're all doomed. And we've got to be under that covering. The next paragraph. I saw some who were not standing stiffly for present truth. Their knees were trembling and their feet sliding because they were not firmly planted on the truth. And the covering of Almighty God could not be drawn over them while they were thus trembling. Satan was trying his every art to hold them where they were until the ceiling was passed, until the covering was drawn over God's people and they left without a shelter. Pretty serious stuff, isn't it? Some knees are trembling and some feet are sliding right now. Let's be very, very sure it is not ours. How about it? Amen. Let's be very, very sure that we have this covering. Satan is going to do everything he can to keep us from being under that cover, because that, he knows, is our only protection. And we've got to have that covering at all costs. So what I'm going to be focusing on this week is what I believe to be present truth. Truth that has now come right down to the edge of time and is the most important truth of all the truths that we hold and believe in. The ones that will make, a, make, it, a, a make or break situation for our eternal life. Now, if you'll focus on the other half of the page, I found something in Stephen Bohr's book, Worship at Satan's Throne. Unfortunately, he said, many contemporary Seventh-day Adventist churches have changed the 11 o'clock hour from a worship service to an entertainment session. Instead of recognizing that the reason for the worship service is for God's corporate people to come and worship God, to bow before Him, and to hear His will for their lives, these churches have felt that the purpose is to attract and fill the church with, quote, seekers. 
This shift has, let, left, has led the worship service to become anthropocentric, in other words, man-centered, instead of theocentric, God-centered, and has led churches to be more concerned about whether the seekers and other non-Adventist Christians will feel comfortable in their dress, with the music, with the style of worship, with the message, etc. But this shift in focus detracts us from our distinctive message and mission. Ellen White has underlined that what needs to be preached in our churches today is present truth. And what does it mean to preach present truth? Present truth preaching focuses on what Jesus is doing right now in the heavenly sanctuary and all that goes along with it. If you want to know what present truth is today, simply discover what Jesus is doing in the sanctuary now and proclaim that. Lamentably, many Adventist churches today are preaching the truths that are found in the court and the holy place of the sanctuary, but they are not preaching the present truth of the most holy place where Jesus now ministers. That is a very important page that you just looked at. Our focus, where is our focus going to be? Is it going to be on the most holy place of the sanctuary where Jesus is doing his final work of atonement in the heavenly sanctuary? Or is it going to be in the outer court where Jesus died for the sins of mankind, as important as that is? And is it going to be the work in the holy place, as important as that is? Or is it though to be in the most holy place where Jesus has opened a new door into his heavenly sanctuary and shut another door? And many people don't know that the door is open to that new ministry. We need to tell people what that is. We need to share what that ministry is that Jesus Christ is doing for the very end of time because that happens to be the time we're living in, right? Amen. We didn't ask for it. Here we are. We live in the last generation. Let's know what this is all about and know what it means to be last generation Christians, the ones who live at the end of time. So I suggest that to you as uh, uh, a very important principle that, uh, that we need to keep in mind. Present truth is our focus for this week. Now, what we're going to do is very simply address the gospel. What is the way of salvation through Jesus Christ? How are we saved? And what does it mean for us today? You have two trees. I'm going to put the, the very same thing up here on the easel in a chart form, but you have it right in front of you. We're going to, all we're going to do in this next period is to look at these two trees, to look at what each gospel teaches because the two trees represent two Gospels, two ways of salvation, two understandings of how a person is saved. And we're just going to address them. Remember I said we're not going to prove anything yet. We're not going to give any biblical evidence yet. That'll come later. We're just going to address and define what each of these Gospels is teaching. We're going to start with the one on the left-hand side of your page that looks like that. The problem that we've got is we're sinners, right? And we need something called salvation. So what is the problem? What's wrong with us that needs to be made right? What is the issue at stake that's got to be corrected? Well, the problem is sin. We are sinners before God. We are lost. We are condemned. What is sin? This gospel, the one we're addressing right now, says sin is not primarily what you do or say or even think. Sin is the way you are born. You see, here's the issue. Adam and Eve made a tragic decision 6,000 years ago. They not only turned this world upside down, so now that we can uh, sometimes barely exist and the world tries to destroy us with floods and cyclones and hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes, but they also turned our natures inside out. For Adam and Eve, it was easy to obey. It was easy to love. It was easy to just have the right spirit at all times. Irritation, what was that? Losing their temper, impossible. Their nature was just built to be happy and joyous and friendly and, and, and kind and merciful and compassionate. 
Well, did that nature stay that way after they sinned? Just check your own. How about us? Is it easy to be generous and kind and loving at all times? Or is it much easier to be selfish and proud and arrogant and irritable and all the rest? And so our natures have been turned inside out. Our natures are not our friends. We make good decisions, we make good resolutions, and then an hour or two later our nature kicks in and all the resolutions are out the window. So nature is not so good. This gospel says that this nature that we have inherited is so bad that all we have to do to be a condemned sinner, lost and going to hell, is to get ourselves born. Once we are born, we are sinners. Oh yeah, we lose our temper now and then. That's an outgrowth of our sin. Yes, we are unkind. That's just another outgrowth of our sin. Our sin is our nature, this gospel says. Now what I'm going to be doing as we go through this is I'm going to be sharing little tidbits, little sentence quotations as we go through. Keep one thing in mind as I share these quotations. Everyone is from a Seventh-day Adventist. Maybe a pastor, maybe a teacher, maybe a layperson in the Adventist church. Every statement I read is going to be from a Seventh-day Adventist. Here's the first one describing this point of sin as nature. This perfect child, a father wrote, looking upon his newborn child, who has done no wrong act in his life, is already sinful. You cannot rid yourself of sin by not sinning. It is in you before your first breath. So that little baby that looks so innocent, that looks so peaceful and happy, is a sinner because it has inherited this bad equipment. Another person put it this way. A baby is born a sinner before it has ever committed one sinful act. Have you ever heard the phrase, born sinners? That's where it comes from. A baby is born a sinner before it has ever committed one sinful act. Now, what is the implication of that, that a baby is born a sinner? Listen very carefully now. This sinful state means that if a baby dies a few hours after birth, he or she is subject to the second death even though he or she has never broken any commandment. So that baby that looks so innocent is subject to the second death because of inheriting faulty equipment inside. Second death because of that. So the bottom line of this gospel is that sin is our equipment. Sin is our birthright. Sin is a state of being. Sin is the way we are, just like we describe ourselves as having a certain color hair or eyes. That's just the way we are. We are sinners, condemned and lost, because of being born into this world. Now, if that is true, then the next point is easily true. You don't even have to argue about it, even open the Bible to understand it. If every baby is born a sinner because of inheriting a fallen nature, then can Jesus be a sinless Savior if He inherits our fallen nature? He would be a sinner too. And if Jesus is a sinner, He can't save anyone. So this gospel has to teach, it has no option, that Jesus skips 4,000 years of heredity and he takes Adam's nature, that nature that was loving and kind and generous and never thought to do a wrong thing and would never consider losing his temper. Jesus takes that nature, Adam's nature, in the Garden of Eden. So those are the two points that undergird everything else in this gospel. They are so important that I want to go back over them so we understand them thoroughly and completely and that we understand exactly what is meant. And to do this, I want to draw a little chart here. We have various stages in our life, from our birth until the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we will just identify this as birth, and then we'll come over here to the new birth. And then we'll go very quickly to something called the close of probation, and then over here is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay. One thing is constant in our entire experience. From our birth, if we are fortunate enough to live, live until the second coming of Jesus Christ, one thing is constant. We keep our fallen nature. 
There is no promise in Scripture that short of Jesus' second coming, we get rid of our fallen nature. That's part of our equipment. It's part of our body. It's part of our whole way of existence. So even after the new birth, we still have, as you've noticed, our fallen nature. And even after the close of probation, we still have our fallen nature. So that remains constant all the way through from birth until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean in terms of our relationship to God and our salvation? Well, from birth to the new birth, we're simply under condemnation. We are condemned because of this nature, as we read. Every baby born is subject to the second death. We are condemned because of a fallen nature. Now, when we're born again, something happens. Our nature isn't removed, but God forgives our sin. And remember, in this gospel, sin is our nature. This is sin all the way through. We could just make that point doubly clear here. This is sin, this is sin, and this is sin. That is our sin. So what does God do after the new birth? He forgives. He forgives our sin. He covers it. Our, our nature, our sin is forgiven. God forgives us. Now the problem is we still have this nature after the close of probation. It's still sin. Now what's God going to do? Close of probation means there's no more forgiveness offered. But we still need forgiveness because we've still got the same nature. Oh, you aren't losing your temper anymore? Irrelevant. You aren't thinking bad thoughts anymore? Irrelevant. You've still got your nature, according to this gospel. Your nature is still there. So that means your nature is still sinning as much here as it did over here when you were born or even here after your new birth experience. So what does God have to do and in, in the period between the close of probation and the second coming? He has to continue forgiving. This one isn't working so well. Let's just change it. He is going to have to continue forgiving. No difference. It has to be the same or else we're lost. We're condemned. Because we were condemned here, we were not condemned here because of forgiveness, and so we are not condemned here also because of forgiveness. Which means from this point all the way to the second coming of Jesus Christ, justification is necessary. We need justifying or forgiving grace just as much according to this gospel after the close of probation as we need it today. Because the issue in sin according to this gospel is not what you do or say or think, it's what equipment you have. And therefore, if your equipment is sin here, just as it was here or here, it must come under the same umbrella of justification, which means forgiveness, just a big word for forgiveness, here as much as you're having experience of forgiveness here. And so there can be no change in Christ's ministry in heaven according to this gospel until the second coming. And what this gospel teaches is when the second coming happens, then God removes your nature, He replaces it with a perfect nature, and then you won't be sinning anymore. And then you won't need forgiveness or justification anymore. Only after the second coming of Christ is the need for forgiveness unnecessary in this gospel. Now, I've come across a few interesting quotations. For instance, here's one from Early Writings, page 48. Then, this is after the close of probation, there will be no priest in the sanctuary to offer their confessions and their prayers before the Father's throne. How do we get forgiveness if there's no priest offering our confessions before the throne? Here's another one, Great Controversy 425. Uh, the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above. That is at the close of probation we're talking about. Christ's intercession for sins ceases. One more, 
Great Controversy 614, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. So you see, you've got a little disconnect here. Something isn't quite the way it should be. We need forgiveness. We need justification after the close of probation, just as much as we need it today. But Jesus Christ is not a high priest in the sanctuary offering up our confessions any longer. What is happening here? Is there something very, very wrong in this picture? Keep that in mind. This gospel teaches that sin is as constant as breathing from the moment you're born until the moment you die or until Jesus comes. Sin is the way we are, not what we do or say or even think. That's just an outgrowth of our sin. All right, now, the issue of Christ. You know, it's really not about his nature. It's about how he was tempted. Adam and Eve, let's go to Adam and Eve. How were they tempted in the Garden of Eden? Could Satan run around the garden and harass them and make their life miserable? What, were the, what was the rule? One tree. One tree in the whole garden, not only the garden, but the whole world, right? One tree at which Satan could access the minds of Adam and Eve. Would you like that uh, rule? What if there was just one tree in the whole world? Wouldn't it be nice just to stay away from the tree? You know, hindsight is very good. I would have loved to advise Adam and Eve. Of course, you know, looking back is so much easier. Adam, just, just build a wall around that tree. I mean, build it high with no doors and no windows. Pretend it isn't there. Make a big detour around it. Never get near the tree. That's all they had to do. And they would never have been tempted, not even once. You see why their sin was so bad? Because it was so easy to obey. And they had to make every effort to disobey. And so Adam sinned in spite of all that. Now, when Adam sinned, did the rules of temptation change? Now where could Satan have access to Adam and Eve and you and me? At some tree out there? Or within your nature? Is that where he has access to us? Within our natures. He can now tempt us 24 hours a day, whenever he pleases, middle of the night, middle of the day, from within. I used to tell my students, I really don't need Satan to tempt me. I do a fine job all by myself. I am my own worst tempter. My nature tempts me. My nature pulls me. And those are the rules today in the, Garden of Eden, in the world that is not the Garden of Eden. We are tempted from within. Question is, which way was Christ tempted? Was he tempted like Adam, out there? Or was he tempted from within as we are tempted? That's the issue. That is the issue. And this gospel says he was not tempted from within. Nothing from within pulled him to sin. There was nothing in him, inside him, that led him to desire anything out of harmony with God's will. In fact, one leading proponent of this gospel says, Christ was tempted three times in his experience. Number one, in the wilderness. Number two, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And number three, <clears throat> at the cross. Notice what, the th what is in common with all those three. He went out there to be tempted. He wasn't tempted back in Nazareth. He wasn't tempted in Capernaum. He went out to the wilderness, and there he met head to head with Satan. He went to the garden and battled Satan again. He went to the cross and battled Satan again. See, he was tempted, this gospel says, on the big issues. Would he continue his mission? Would he trust his father? Would he do what God sent him to do? He was not tempted on the little nitty-gritties. Would he overeat? Would he be impatient? Would he, be, uh, would he gossip? No, no, he wasn't tempted on those things, like you and I. He was tempted on the big issues, and he was tempted out there, not from within his nature, but out there, outside, just like Adam and Eve were tempted in the Garden of Eden. You had to find temptation. It didn't find you. So this gospel says Christ's temptations were substantially different from the temptations that I have. That's the basis for this whole gospel, those two points. We sin constantly, and Jesus Christ was tempted in different ways than we are. Now, 
given that foundation, up to the next step, justification. Justification, just a big word for forgiveness. But please notice the word sanctification is not there. Why is the word sanctification not part of this gospel? Let me read it to you. Justification is 100% Christ's work. Sanctification is a work done by us, aided by the indwelling Christ. Is a work done by us worth anything for salvation? Does that merit anything? Does that achieve anything? Sanctification is a work done by us, aided by the indwelling Christ. Well, if sanctification is my work with a little help from Christ, then it can't be part of the saving process. It has to be an after result of the saving process. I get saved, and then I'm going to experience sanctification. Sort of like the um, caboose on the end of a train. The train, is, the locomotive, is what saves, and the caboose comes along for the ride. Sanctification comes along, but is not a part of the saving process according to this gospel. Now, what are the practical implications of this? Let me read you one more statement. Doing wrong or even believing wrong does not necessarily imply a rejection of Jesus. Doing wrong or even believing wrong does not necessarily imply a rejection of Jesus. See, this gospel is very simple. It's not complicated. There is one way to be saved and one way to be lost. The way to be saved is accept Jesus as your Savior. Accept His life in place of your life. Believe in His atoning blood, and you're saved. Once you're saved, the only way you can be lost is to turn your back on Jesus Christ and say, I don't want you in my life anymore. I'm walking my own way. I'm doing my own thing. I don't want you anymore. Anything in between that and you're still saved. Let me illustrate. Let's say you've been a Seventh-day Adventist for a year or two. And you've accepted the Seventh-day Sabbath and you believe that it's the right day, God's holy day, and should not be violated by any business or secular activities. But you know times are tough. These are not easy times to earn a living. So you decide that to keep your family fed and clothed, you are going to have to open your business again on the Sabbath. It's the one day you get your business. And so you open your business on the Sabbath and you keep it open. The question is, will that jeopardize your saving relationship with Jesus Christ? Question, did Sabbath keeping earn you a place in heaven? Well, no, it didn't. You accepted Jesus Christ. He is the one who gave you salvation. Then it follows, notice the logic, Sabbath breaking can't lose you your place in heaven. If Sabbath keeping doesn't get you into heaven, Sabbath breaking can't keep you out of heaven. Same is true for anything else that you can even think of. Tithe paying. Were you saved by tithe paying? No. Well, then you can't be lost by withholding tithe. That's a sanctification issue. That's not a justification issue. And sanctification is a result of being saved, not a part of being saved. It is not a factor in salvation. And so this gospel says, that doing wrong or even believing wrong does not necessarily imply a rejection of Jesus because I still believe in Jesus. I still want to serve Him. I still want to be part of His family. Now, do you think I overstated this? Let me read some more statements to you. I do not believe that you have to keep the Sabbath in order to be saved. This is not Adventist theology. I do not believe that you have to keep the Sabbath in order to be saved. Let me read another one. Since right behavior is never the ground of our acceptance with God, we would all agree with that. Since right behavior is never the ground of our acceptance with God, wrong behavior cannot keep a person out of heaven. Follow that little bit of logic right through. Since right behavior won't get you in, wrong behavior won't keep you out. One is not lost by not keeping the Sabbath or giving up the Sabbath. One is saved because one chooses to enter into a saving relationship with Jesus. The only way to lose that salvation is if a person chooses to reject that saving relationship. 
You came into salvation by believing that in Jesus as your Savior. The only way that you're going to lose that salvation is if you reject that saving relationship. So the practical results of justification only in this gospel is that sanctification issues such as Sabbath keeping, returning tithe, lifestyle standards are not salvation issues. They are good issues. They are things which will make you good witnesses. They will enable you to be better individuals, but they are not salvation related. You will be saved irrespective of your, of your Sabbath keeping issues. That's what this is saying. So justification imputed only obviously leads to the next step. Well, since we're born sinners, since we're sinning constantly by nature, since we're only going to be forgiven constantly for constant sin, forget about perfection. That is a pie in the sky dream. In fact, it's fanaticism. It takes away from the glory of Christ's forgiving grace on the cross of Calvary. Don't focus on perfection. It reject it, and then you'll live a happier life. No perfection possible. All right, now what is this gospel that I've just spent the last half an hour describing to you? This is the gospel of the Christian church. This is orthodox Christianity. This is mainstream Christian teaching. This has been so for the last 17 centuries of the Christian church. This is no newcomer on the block. This is what the great Christian evangelists are preaching in those great evangelistic meetings in which people are pouring down from the balconies to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and they're making their commitment to be part of God's family. This is the gospel they're responding to. This is the mainstream gospel of the Christian church. Now, this gospel has been knocking on the doors of the Seventh-day Adventist church for quite a while now. This is not a newcomer. You have all grown up, if you've been Seventh-day Adventists, in this gospel, and if you've newly come to the Seventh-day Adventist church, you've come into this gospel even within Adventism. What are some of the effects in the tree, in the fruits, that this gospel produces within the Seventh-day Adventist church. The judgment. Seventh-day Adventists teach that the judgment began in the investigative judgment began in 1844 as Jesus began a new work in the heavenly sanctuary opening up the books of record and making final decisions about salvation for those individuals who live on this earth. Some people have questioned that. Some people have said in the Adventist church no, nothing really happened up in heaven in 1844. All that happened was God started a new movement down here on earth. Questions have arisen. Major questions arose about 30 years ago in this area. And then they were kind of dealt with in a, to a measure, to a degree. But listen to a more recent book, not many years ago. Does the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine of the cleansing of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment distort, undermine, or contradict the one and only New Covenant gospel of grace? And the answer is yes, it does. If you believe in an investigative judgment that is going on in the heavenly sanctuary, you are undermining, distorting, and contradicting the covenant of grace, the gospel of grace. That's what this says. Another person stated in this way, the investigative judgment is an offense to the gospel, a serious deviation that undermines the fullness of salvation in the person of Jesus Christ. The judgment is an offense to the gospel. So questions have arisen about the judgment and why it is important and is it relevant and does it make any difference? Ellen White, Ellen G. White, I'm going to share with you a letter this is going to surprise you. This is a letter written by Seventh-day Adventist parents to Andrews University as their children were attending that institution. How do we keep our teenagers in touch with Christ? The question is. Great question. How do we keep our teenagers in touch with Christ? Number one, deep six messages to young people and all other compilations. There is not a shred of gospel in the lot. Number one, get rid of messages to young people because it's just a compilation anyway. Number two, 
stop publishing Steps to Christ, which is simply another works approach to salvation. Stop publishing Steps to Christ. Now that's Steps to Christ, folks. That is not the great controversy, is it? If you're wanting to share a book with someone that you don't want to offend at the first point, you might just share Steps to Christ. It's the simple book. It's the easy to read book. It's the common level book. And yet, they said the only way to really help our young people is to throw that book away. Stop publishing it. It's works. It's works. To help you understand that, I have, we're going to take you back to the year 1950, when a gentleman that later had quite a bit of contact with a Seventh-day Adventist church by the name of Barnhouse, Donald Gray Barnhouse, was publishing a magazine called Eternity Magazine. This was a very influential magazine in the Christian world. Many subscribers to this magazine in 1950. He got a hold of the book Steps to Christ, and he did a review of it in his magazine. Listen to what he said. Steps to Christ is false in all its parts. It bears the mark of the counterfeit from the first page. It contains satanic error. Once again, I remind you that Steps to Christ that is being discussed here. Why this attitude toward a very simple little book on how we relate to Jesus Christ on a personal level day by day? Well, because this person that I'm sharing this review from believed in this gospel. Understand that now. This person believed that this is the way of salvation. And Ellen G. White doesn't believe one point of this way of salvation. He understood that. And in the book Steps to Christ, there is way too much about surrender. And the dreaded word obedience pops up in the book as well. And anything related to that is sanctification, and you focus on that, and you're into legalism, and you are into fanaticism and heresy. And so for Donald Gray Barnhouse, writing in 1950, the book Steps to Christ represented the ultimate heresy in salvation satanic error because it does not square with this gospel. It is totally opposite to this gospel. We need to understand, my friends, that simple things like steps to Christ and the Adventist understanding of salvation are completely opposite to the way the Christian world has understood the way of salvation for centuries and even today. And apparently, the Seventh-day Adventist parents had bought this argument that Steps to Christ was into the legalism phase, the error phase of Christianity. Questions have arisen about Ellen White. You notice there are question marks at all points of this. Question marks have arisen about Ellen White uh, in the last years because of this. Up on the ladder of what implications this gospel will have in terms of Seventh-day Adventist teaching, Seventh-day Adventists, and you have been finding ways that you can express this clearly. Seventh-day Adventists teach that the law was not nailed to the cross by Jesus Christ, that the law, the Ten Commandments, are as important today as they ever were in Old Testament times. The Old Testament is not a system of salvation by works. It is not a way that you get saved by obeying the law. It was always there as God's standard and God's way of happiness, and life, and it continues to be the way. That's what Seventh-day Adventists teach. But you see, the problem is that we're sinning constantly by nature, according to this gospel. And sin, if I read my Bible correctly, is the transgression of the law. So that means we are constantly breaking the law every second of our lives by the natures we have within us. How can we teach that the law is keepable and is for us today while every one of us are lawbreakers constantly? There seems to be a disconnect there. Something isn't matching up. How can you teach that the law is good and holy and just and can be kept if we're constantly breaking that law? And so questions have come up about the law. And of course, the Sabbath is in the heart of the law. And so Sabbath keeping becomes one of those issues in which it has really not a salvation issue. It's just a, a nice thing. In fact, I came across this little statement in a letter far too long. We were taught that in order to be saved, we must keep the Sabbath and all of the other things associated with legalism. 
Sabbath, and all the other things associated with legalism. You see, once again, in this gospel mentality, anything having to do with obedience, Sabbath keeping, or all those issues is legalism because you are trying to work your way to heaven according to this gospel. And then you go up to the top of the tree, health and standards. Uh, are you going to be going into heaven because you're a vegetarian? No. Will that get you a place in heaven? Well, then, if that is not a salvation issue, it is only a sanctification issue, then why should we be focusing so much on what we eat and how we sleep and how much exercise we get? Because our bodies are kind of immaterial to this whole thing. The only question is, do you love Jesus? Have you accepted Him as your Savior? Health reform? No, that gets into nitty-gritty legalism things, and you don't want to focus on that because that takes your focus off of Christ, this gospel says. And so health issues become non-salvation issues. Standards of the church. Now here we're talking about all of the standards in a lump. We're talking about what we watch, what we read, what we listen to, what entertainment we participate in, and even the clothes we wear. All of those are standards. And of course, those are sanctification issues too, aren't they? So they can't be salvation related either. Uh, let me read you a few statements that you might find interesting. God's salvation is so extravagant, so comprehensive, that it can't be increased or diminished by what we eat, drink, or wear. See, there it is again. You can't increase your salvation. You can't diminish your salvation by what you eat, drink, or wear. Exercise and a good diet contribute to a long and useful life, but they don't add to our salvation. They're good things to have. They help you out. Better to have them than not have them, but they're not related to salvation. Here's another one. Members give assent to various standards and rules as a condition of membership in the organization. We need to keep in mind that this assent is not related to their salvation, only to being a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now you think about that for just a little bit. Why do we tell people as they want to become Seventh-day Adventists that they really should stop smoking and drinking? Those are standards of the church. We do not want Seventh-day Adventists to be involved in smoking and drinking or in the use of drugs. Well, because that's one of the rules of the church, you see. We, every organization has rules. Even when you work for a business, they have rules about what you wear. So we're an organization, too. We have rules. One of our rules is no use of alcohol or tobacco. If you want to have your name on the dotted line as a Seventh-day Adventist, you must agree with those rules. You understand, though, it's not related to your salvation. It has nothing to do with your relationship with God. These are simply rules of the church. That's what I just read. Non-salvation issues. Another person said, though I believe something to be correct from a religious perspective, it is not a matter of salvation. Many, many things in this gospel are not matters of salvation not related to your saving relationship with Jesus Christ. They may be good things, they may be true things, they may be things that are worthwhile, but they are not salvation related. You see, this gospel focuses only on one thing, forgiveness through Jesus Christ and believing in Him as your Savior. Anything apart from that is interesting, useful, and helpful, but not related to salvation. That's why all of these doctrines and these lifestyle issues are not issues of salvation. And this has been coming into the Seventh-day Adventist Church in very strong perspective in the last 30 years. Many question marks about the things that Adventists believe because this gospel simply doesn't match up with that. Now, on your chart, not on this uh, chart, but on your chart, there's a big long word underneath this gospel. What is that word? Predestination. Predestination. The reason it's under the chart is because when this gospel was first developed back in the third and fourth centuries, everyone, and I mean everyone, believed in predestination. How did you get saved? God decided before you were born if you were going to be saved or lost. You didn't have a say in the matter. If you didn't like God's decision, tough. God is sovereign. Who are you to question God? Predestination says God decides salvation issues. 
Everyone believed that. For centuries, for centuries, not just in the Catholic world, but also in the Protestant world as the Reformers came on the scene, Martin Luther and John Calvin also believed in predestination, that you do not have a choice in your salvation. God makes that choice for you. So this gospel fit beautifully into that. Well, we're born sinners because of bad equipment. Jesus lived an obedient life because he had good equipment. I am forgiven for my bad equipment constantly, and at the second coming, Jesus will replace my bad equipment with good equipment, and then I won't sin anymore. It's all equipment related, and all been what God put into you and what God takes away from you. And so this gospel fit beautifully with predestination. What is strange is that not many Christians believe in predestination anymore, but they still believe in the gospel built upon predestination. I found a neat little statement that says this, How do men fall into such error? By starting with false premises and then bringing everything to bear to prove the error true. In some cases, the first principles have a measure of truth interwoven with the error. How do people teach error? You start with a false premise that you really haven't checked out very carefully. And then you build truth upon that false premise. And that false premise has some good points to it. As you've noticed throughout this gospel, there are some good points all the way through this gospel. It's not all bad. There are some interesting and some logical ish, uh, points of evidence here. And so when you start with a false premise and then build upon that, everything seems to go wrong. All right, now we're going to switch gears. I think I find your full agreement on the next thing I'm going to say. I do not believe that God chooses whether we'll be saved or lost irrespective of our choice. I believe that the Bible teaches conclusively without any question or shadow of doubt that the way of salvation is, that the, the salvation issue for your life is determined by you and you alone. Not even your parents, not friends, but you make your choice and God respects that choice. It's called free choice. I believe that's the heart and soul of everything that God does throughout the universe. Free choice. The angels had free choice. Our earth had free choice. You have free choice today. The unfallen worlds have, everyone have free, has free choice. And that is the bottom line of another gospel. What is sin? Sin is not an accident of birth in this gospel. Sin is not something that you inherit from your parents. You are not condemned because you happen to have bad genes in your system. Sin, according to this gospel, is very simple. When you know the difference between right and wrong and deliberately choose what is wrong and you say, I'll just want to do it my way. I know what's right, but I'm going to do it my way. Then you sin. In this gospel, sin is always a decision you make, a choice you make. It is never something apart from you or inherent within you. It is not a state of being. It is an attitude of mind. It is something you choose in your own mind. Someone wrote in a letter, For several months now, I have been puzzling over the question, What did I accept as truth that brought me to a sleepy attitude towards victory in my life? Why did I believe that I really couldn't have any victory? Now it is clear that I had a misunderstanding as to the nature of sin. I have always accepted the fact that I needed to gain the victory, but at the same time I saw the task as impossible because I was regarding sin as a state of being. How do you overcome a state of being? How do you overcome the color of your hair? How do you overcome how tall you are? No, you live with those things. You survive the way you were given a birthright. And you like some things and you dislike other things about the way you are. And so if sin is a state of being, I dislike it. I'm not happy with it. But I can't overcome a state of being. I can just adjust to it. I can live with it as best I can. I thought that was an interesting little letter that came in. This gospel says that sin is always the choice that we make. Based on that, Jesus Christ can actually take my equipment. We call it fallen nature, the nature we have within us. 
and he can actually live for 33 years without giving in to that nature even once. A miracle? Yes, it is. But God is full of miracles. And yes, Jesus Christ is tempted in all points as we are. He is not tempted just three times. He is tempted day and night in, from within and from without. He's tempted in Nazareth. He's tempted in Jerusalem. He's tempted growing up as a boy. He's tempted at all stages of his life in exactly the same way that we are tempted. Jesus is tempted just as we are tempted. Here's what someone said uh, regarding this issue of sin, dealing specifically with problems that every one of us faces. One might have thoughts of stealing, or even have to contend with homosexual thoughts. But that doesn't make a person a thief or a homosexual until those thoughts are acted upon. That's what this gospel teaches. You might have thoughts that come to your mind that you wonder, where did that thought come from? I don't like that thought. It plagues me. But the thought, the nature, is not a sin. It is the acting upon it that turns it into a sin. And Jesus never did that. Jesus never acted upon that at all. Here's a little dilemma I'm going to pose to you. Let's say the first gospel is correct, and Jesus Christ did not take our nature. He took Adam's perfect nature. You know what? God is asking you to do more than Jesus Christ. He's asking you to overcome sin in a fallen nature, and He didn't give Jesus a fallen nature to overcome sin in. He gave Jesus a perfect nature. I'd say it's a lot easier to overcome sin in a perfect nature than a fallen nature. What do you think? And so that gospel says that Jesus is asking you to do more than he was asking Christ. Well, nobody wants to believe that. So there's a second option. If God isn't asking you to do more than he asked of Christ, then maybe, just maybe, since you have a fallen nature and Jesus had an unfallen nature, Maybe he isn't asking you to overcome sin in a fallen nature. He'll wait until he gives you an unfallen nature at the second coming, and then you'll be able to overcome sin. So the second option is what most Christians believe, that since Jesus was so different than me in nature, and I've got this fallen nature that I've got to contend with every day of my life, God isn't going to ask me to overcome all sin. He'll take that away from me at the second coming. Then I won't have to be worried about sinning anymore. So the second option is what most Christians take. Someone said very well, the nature of Christ's discussion of recent times is a branch off the righteousness by faith discussion. You see, the issue is this. This is not an issue all by itself. Did Christ have a fallen nature or not? A lot of controversy on that. The issue is it's part of the righteousness by faith issue. One's view of the nature of Christ will definitely affect his concept of salvation, and that influences his behavior. So the only reason to even discuss this is because it leads to something else in our daily relationship, and we'll see how that works as we go on. All right, now we move up the tree. Justification and sanctification are both parts of this gospel, both equal parts of the saving process. Now, why is that important? Let's say you've been coming to church and you see a person in church who has a marvelous testimony. This person just stands up and for five minutes in church during testimony time just praises the Lord for his walk with the Lord. He's having a marvelous experience. Jesus has given him peace and forgiveness and he is happy in the Lord and he loves to study the Bible and he is just, for five minutes he goes on about his happiness and his joy in Jesus Christ. And you say, wow, that's pretty neat. I'd like to know a little more about that. Maybe I can learn from this person. So you decide to follow him home from church one day. Strange thing you see is you, he gets out of the car. He's yelling at the kids. They must have really done something in the car that ticked him off, and he's really berating them. He's yelling at them at the top of his voice. And all the way up the driveway, he's yelling at the kids, and his wife steps in to try to kind of soften the blow. And all of a sudden, he's yelling at her, too. And by the time they get to the driveway, he's even hit his wife. What do you think? Is there something wrong with that beautiful picture of joy in the Lord? Justification was great, but where's the sanctification? Where's the experience?
turn it around. Let's say a person that you know in church is very careful in terms of Sabbath keeping, tithe paying, standards of the church, does everything that you can ever imagine that a Seventh-day Adventist should do. And whenever you talk to him, there's no happiness, there's no peace, there's no joy. It's always, oh, I've got to do all these things, and if I don't do them, I'm going to burn in hell. And so, yeah, I'm going to keep the Sabbath, but boy, am I glad when it's over and I can get on with my life. It's such a, it's so hard. Is there something wrong with that picture? Yes. Sanctification seems to be working, but where's the justification? Where's the peace? Where's the happiness? What I'm saying is these two have got to work together, or they don't work very well at all. They do not work in separation from each other. They do not work apart from each other. Now, having said that this is an important part, I want to again stress the difference between these two Gospels. This is the heart and soul of the difference between these two Gospels right here. The first Gospel says, and I'm going to read it to you again so we are very clear. The first Gospel says, Justification is 100% Christ's own perfect work done for us. Sanctification follows 50-50 as a cooperative work. I work and God works. Okay, that's the first Gospel. Justification is 100% Christ's work. Sanctification is 50% Christ's work and 50% my work. All right. Is justification 100% Christ's work? What do you think? Yes. Do you provide some things that make it work? Nope. It is 100% Christ's work. Absolutely, that is correct. But do you have to do some things and believe some things in order to be part of this 100% work of Christ? Let's be very simple. Do you have to believe that the Bible is God's inspired word? That it's God saying to us, this is the way of salvation. Do you have to believe that tucked away in the Bible is a story of a man who came down to this earth from heaven, born of a virgin, lived an entire life without sinning, died on a cross for the sins of mankind? Do you have to believe that? Huh. So you have to believe quite a bit, don't you? Then do you have to believe that in order to participate in this work of justification, you have to repent of your old way of life and say, I don't want to live that way anymore. I don't like it and I don't want any part of it. Do you even have to go to some people that you have offended and say, I'm sorry that I wronged you? Confess your sins one to another? You have to do that too? Wow, there's a lot of things you have to do, isn't there? Now, if you do all of those things, if you believe the Bible, believe in, in the way of salvation, confess your sins, and let's just say Jesus never died on the cross, what good will that accomplish? Will that get you anywhere? You've wasted your energy, time, and breath because you're not going to be justified or saved if Jesus didn't die on the cross. So make no mistake about it, the only cause of being saved, justified, is Jesus' life and death. That's the only cause of salvation. But are there some conditions of salvation that you must choose and be part of before you get into the cause of salvation? Conditions of salvation, cause of salvation. Very important distinction here. Justification is God saving you. That's salvation. Conditions of salvation is believing what God says, believing that Jesus Christ is a Savior, confessing your sins, because you have to move from here, where there's no salvation at all, over to here, where salvation is being given. This is the place, Jesus Christ, His saving work. That's right here. You're over there. You've got to move by your choices from over there to over here. Your, con your choices don't earn you salvation. They don't credit you with salvation. They place you in the position where salvation is offered. So justification is 100% Christ's work. Absolutely. Now the question. What about sanctification? Is it 50% or is it 100%? Let's take Sabbath keeping. Sabbath keeping. Let's say you're very careful in putting aside your business activities every Sabbath day, that you go to church on a regular basis, that you do not do things that are out of harmony with God's will as best you understand it on the Sabbath day. Does that make you a Sabbath keeper? 
And I'm going to say, no, it doesn't. What it does is make you a Saturday keeper. You are keeping a seventh day as best you know how. Who are the best Saturday keepers this world has ever seen? The Pharisees. You know what Jesus had to spend half his ministry doing? Trying to convert the Saturday keepers of his time into Sabbath keepers? They didn't have a clue as to what Sabbath keeping was about. They kept Saturday precisely. They had so many rules for, for how to do it. They made sure they would not violate the laws of the Sabbath. But what were they plotting in their hearts while they were keeping the Sabbath day holy? The murder of the Son of God who gave the Sabbath. Is that Sabbath keeping? That isn't even close to Sabbath keeping. That is Saturday keeping. There are some Christians who don't know too much about us, and they give us a name which is not our name. Have you heard the name Seven-Day Adventist? That's what some people call us, Seven-Day Adventist. You know they're right. If we aren't Seven-Day Adventists, we cannot possibly be Seventh-Day Adventists. If we're not a Christian on Tuesday, forget about Sabbath. If we're not living the Spirit of Christ every day of the week, there is no possibility of keeping a holy Sabbath day because only a holy person can keep a holy Sabbath, and the Sabbath is holy. Who will provide that holy experience, my friends? Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Spirit. So, uh, who makes you a Sabbath keeper? It's Jesus Christ. Do you have to make some decisions to be part of this Sabbath-keeping experience? Do you have to decide to set, apart, set aside your business? Do you have to decide that Friday night to Saturday night is going to be holy time? Yes, you have to make all those decisions. Not one of those decisions will make you a Sabbath-keeper. But they, those are the conditions to place you in the place where the Holy Spirit can transform your life from the inside out and turn you into a Sabbath-keeper or a tithe-returner. See, tithe paying is not giving 10%. It's becoming happy in sharing with the Lord what He has given to you. It's the experience of tithe that is a sanctification, sanctification issue. It's not just giving back a certain number of dollars to God. That is the decision you make. That doesn't make you a tithe payer. The Holy Spirit puts within you the spirit of generosity in your heart. And that is tithe returning. So all of these things, my friends, are conditions of salvation, justification, sanctification, and causes of salvation. And I say that the first gospel is dead wrong, 100% wrong, when it says that sanctification is 50% my work and 50% God's work. Absolutely not. It is 100% God's work from beginning to end, in exactly the same way as justification. That's the difference the difference between these two Gospels. That's the difference in one short nutshell sentence. All right, let's see. If justification is 100% Christ's work and sanctification is 100% Christ's work, then it is, it, is it remotely possible that perfection, this unreachable ideal, can also be 100% God's work? Is it possible that God can do something seemingly, humanly impossible in our lives? Well, I say, let's find out. Let's see what God can do. If He can do this for me and forgive me of all my past, maybe He can deliver me from my present and give me victory in my present experience. I want to share with you a little story that, or a little illustration that may help. God works like an infinitely skillful physician. He can save and heal anyone who trusts Him. He is not at all satisfied when we come to His office just to be forgiven. He proposes to bring us to the place where we won't have to ask for forgiveness anymore. He offers to heal that place where people do their thinking. Then they won't violate those rules anymore because they don't even want to, and all the bad habits are gone. To some, that sounds ominously like perfection. Servants see all this as a command. Friends see it as a promise. Friends don't want God to settle for anything less. Would you ask a physician not to heal you completely? Would you say 75% healing will be quite sufficient? Thank you. <laughs> to servants who think of salvation as dealing with their legal problems, perfection is yet another requirement. To friends who think of salvation as healing the damage sin has done, perfection is an incredibly generous offer. 
Servants want to be completely forgiven. Friends want to be completely healed. About that matter of perfection, the heavenly physician might call after us as we walk away from his office. Don't worry about that. I've so designed my universe that it's a law people become like the person they worship and admire. If you really stay my trusting friends, perfection will come. I'm not saying you won't struggle anymore, but the struggle won't be the same. I think that's the way it is. If there's any hope of this impossible goal of perfection, it's going to be a miracle of God. It's going to be a gift of God's grace. All of this is grace, grace, and grace. It is not of achieving and earning and meriting. It is God's gift to sinners who are really pretty helpless. And God says, wait, see what I can do with the worst equipment that I could ever imagine. And he can turn that into something you can't imagine. Now, these two Gospels, this is the Gospel I believe is the biblical Gospel. These two Gospels can be summarized by one word. Each one can be summarized by one word. The first Gospel, the Christian Gospel, can be summarized by the word forgiveness. Forgiveness is the word that summarizes that Gospel. If you are forgiven, you are saved. End of discussion. Second Gospel. We can summarize the Gospel with one word, and the word this author has chosen is restoration. Restoration. This emphasis makes Seventh-day Adventist theology unique. I'm going to suggest that what makes Adventism unique is not our Sabbath, or even our teaching of the state of man in death, or even a non-eternally burning hell. What makes Adventism unique is its understanding of how salvation works. Restoration. That's the gospel. And then this author said, marrying strange theology with Adventist theology can justifiably be described as patchwork theology. And my friends, we have been trying to patch together two Gospels that are totally opposite in every way for about 30 years now. And we've got some confusion going. People don't know the way of salvation anymore. And they are buying into a system that isn't working the way God intended. So I believe that these are the key cutting issues of Seventh-day Adventism today. Which gospel are you following? Which gospel is your way of salvation? How do you understand the saving work of Christ? Because friends, there are not two ways of salvation. I guarantee that. There are not two ways to heaven. There is God's way to heaven and there is another way which sounds like God's way. Have you read about a broad way and a narrow way? Most Christians have found the broad way, the easier way, the more comfortable way. And Jesus says, few there be that find the narrow way. The narrow way is a gospel that is not popular. It is not respected. It is not liked. And I'm suggesting this may be the most important decision you will ever make and share with the people that you are ministering to. What is the way, the genuine, the true way of salvation? Now, how does this relate to the uh, issues in the, the branches of the tree? Judgment. Is a judgment necessary in this gospel? Well, in the other gospel, you don't need a judgment. What are you going to judge? Sabbath keeping? Tithe paying? Irrelevant. All the other gospel needs is an angel secretary in the, in the uh, writing in the books of heaven, saved January 25, 1994, checks down the list, never rejected Christ, still saved. The other gospel just needs good record keeping. In the books of heaven, did you accept Christ? Do you still accept Christ? End of discussion. This gospel says, no, there's more to it than that. There's a profession that makes one look like a Christian, and then there's actual Christianity. And there's a difference between those, and we've got to open some books to find out who is professing and who is living, who is really accepting God's grace, and who is simply along for the ride and hoping that he can go in on someone else's coattails. We need a judgment to open these things up. We need to see and understand. So this gospel desperately needs a judgment in the courts of heaven before all questions can be settled. How about now Ellen G. White? I want to share with you something that I came across from Dwight Nelson, pastor of the Andrews University Church for many, many years. If you've been in the Seventh-day Adventist Church very long at all, you've been tempted to not believe in this prophet stuff. In today's religious environment, it's embarrassing to be different. It's embarrassing to have a prophet in your movement. You're considered a bit odd, a little strange. And so, 
we have gone quiet about Ellen White. Without any fanfare or apology, we've simply gone silent. Don't quote her from the pulpit, we admonish each other. Just read the word. Didn't she give some counsel to that effect? But the time has come, this close to the end of Earth's civilization, to re-examine, reflect, re-study, and recommit ourselves to the mission and message of that woman, the most prolific female author in the history of the human race. It's time to stop apologizing for her ministry, both in our own movement and outside of it. Amen. And I say thank you, Dwight, for saying that so well and so clearly. And then I was so happy with him, and then he just stepped right on our toes. He said, we shouldn't call these the red books. They're really the unread books. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Does it make much difference if you hold a bonfire in your backyard and burn all the Ellen White books because you don't want to have any part of them? Or if you have every one of the books on, that she has written in your book, on your bookshelf in pristine condition. Why? Because they're never taken down and looked at. Is there much difference? It's the same thing. And so if we say we believe that Ellen White was a messenger to our time, we'd better be trying to find out what she says that matters for us today. Or else, why bother? The law and the Sabbath. Now here's a little bit of a problem. We say that the law can be kept. Would I get many volunteers if I were to ask you this question today? Would you allow me to follow you home with a video camera and videotape everything you said and did for the next 30 days and then bring you back up on this platform and say, here's an example of a person who has kept God's law perfectly for 30 days? <laughs> Wouldn't get many takers on that, would I? Because you remember just yesterday, don't you, what happened? So how can we say that the law can be kept when none of us want to stand up and say, I'm a law keeper, look at me, I'm the one. What evidence do we have that a person with a fallen nature, like you and me, can keep God's law perfectly as the Bible says it's possible, the law is holy and just and good and it is for our benefit? How can we say, where's our evidence? It isn't you, it isn't me, it isn't anyone I know. Where's the evidence that someone with a fallen nature can perfectly obey God's law? You know, that's the only one right there. If you're looking for hard evidence, that's the only one. You say, well, what about Enoch? I read a text in the Bible that says, all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Is Enoch part of all men? Well, Enoch then can't be the proof either. Jesus Christ is the only one who has lived his entire life from birth to death in total obedience to the law of God, proving that it can be kept. In fallen nature or in unfallen nature? That's the question. Most Christians say he proved it could be kept by Adam. That's what most Christians believe. Adam's nature could keep the law. Jesus Christ came in Adam's nature. He proved that Adam could have obeyed. How does that help me? How does that help me understand if God says you can obey 100% of the time, unless Jesus took our bad equipment and showed that the law could be kept in bad equipment, not just in good equipment, but in really ugly equipment like you and I have. That's why this issue becomes more important than many people realize. This is the only evidence we've got that God's law is keepable in God's last generation. The Sabbath, what's the Sabbath all about? It's very simple. The Sabbath is a flag that you hold up. It says, I love God's law. People can't tell about your coveting. They can tell about your Sabbath keeping. And when you keep the Sabbath, it's your flag. And that's why Satan attacks this one more than any other. It's the flagship of the law. God's way of saying, God, my law is good, and the Sabbath is a part of that. Up to the top of the tree in the health and standards. Remember what I said, and you all agreed, that vegetarianism will not give you a place in heaven. You cannot earn your salvation by your diet. So what is the point of all of these things, health reform and all the rest? Let's say you find a person in your town. This person is in bad shape. He's been smoking and drinking, doing some drugs. 
He's all messed up, and he's really, really tired. He's at the end of his rope of this life. You come along and you say, can I help you? Will you be willing to change your life? And he agrees. He says, I want to change. I'll do anything you say. And so you invite him into your home for 30 days. You teach him everything you know about health reform, getting him off alcohol and tobacco and drugs, teaching him what to eat, teaching him how to sleep and how to exercise and all the rest. And he follows everything you say. He does it 100%. He gets off of all of the bad stuff and he's really living a very good life in terms of physical, uh, physical life. And you know, the statistics are telling us that if you do that, you just might live seven to nine years longer than the person down the street. And this person does exactly that. He lives his extra seven years that he probably would not have gotten. And then he dies of old age, natural causes. And then he wakes up in the wrong resurrection. You know the one at the end of the millennium that none of us want to be a part of? He wakes up in that resurrection. Have we done him any good? Did we really help him much? We gave him seven more years of life. Isn't that what health reform is all about? He didn't have a heart attack. Isn't that what health reform is supposed to be for? And I'm going to say no, not even close. What health reform is is very simple. The body and the mind are one unit. What affects the body affects the mind. What affects the mind affects the body. If the body is all messed up and getting, pump, pumping bad blood into the systems, is a brain a system of the body? If bad blood is being pumped into the brain, is the brain being nourished so it can think straight? Where does God do his saving work? The mind, in the brain. So why should we not then be very concerned about getting the body cleaned up so that the brain is being nourished and God can do his saving work in that brain that thinks straight. I call health reform God's fighting chance to save our souls. We make it awfully tough when the brain can't think right. It is not helping God out in his saving work when our mind is all fogged up by bad stuff we're putting into it. So health reform is to put the mind into the position where God can talk to it and persuade it and use it. Is it important then? Okay. How about standards? And remember all of them. Let's say you listen to your pastor and do what your pastor says 75% of the time. And then do what your favorite TV personality says the other 25% of the time. Who's going to win that little battle? Well, not your pastor. We've got this fallen nature, remember? It doesn't take much to pull us the wrong way. So, what are all the standards for then? Is Satan a good communicator? Does he know how to talk to us? Does he know how even to bypass our mental cognitive abilities and get right down to the emotions? Right down to the bottom line of who, where, we, where we live? He has all kinds of ways, doesn't he, to persuade us of the rightness of his ways. You know what standards are all about? To shut down, as far as humanly possible, Satan's avenues of communication to the mind. You can shut some down, can't you? By your choices of what you listen to, participate in, etc. Hey, if you're shutting down channels of Satan's communication, what have you just opened up? more avenues by which God can talk to you. Does that give God a better chance to save your soul? If God can talk to you and Satan doesn't have as much time in your mind? That's what standards are all about. Standards don't save you. They don't earn you a place in heaven. They allow you, you allow God to have more time in your mind by your standards. You shut Satan out of your mind. You don't allow him into your mind. And that gives God just tons of extra time to talk to you. So standards are exactly the same as health. They give God a fighting chance to save your soul. And if you're not doing that, it's pretty tough even for God to get through to us. Came across this little kind of summary statement. 
It is sad to see the illusion popularized that such lifestyle issues as diet and adornment come from a religious perspective but are, quote, not a matter of salvation. If the written counsel of God addresses a subject, it must be salvation related or God would have left it alone. That's an important principle, friends. If the written counsel of God addresses any subject, it must have something to do for, with our salvation, or God would not have wasted His words. And so I'm saying, let's be very careful when we say, oh, that's not salvation related. That is not a matter of salvation. That doesn't really matter. Here is another statement. He who cherishes the light which God has given him upon health reform has an important aid in the work of becoming sanctified through the truth and fitted for immortality. Health reform is an aid to salvation. It's a way of putting yourself in a place where salvation works and you can be part of this process. And here's a final statement. When people are truly converted and led by the Holy Spirit of Christ, then our dress standards, our dietary practices, our music, and every other aspect of our lifestyle will increasingly reflect the character of our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. The members of our churches will be recognized not just by lifestyle, but by the overall impression of a people who know and love God. That's what it's for. A demonstration of God's character and God's way. All right, this gospel makes all of these issues relevant. You see, these issues do not save. Not one issue here will save us. But the other gospel says they're not even important. Don't worry about them, since they are not what save you. This gospel says since this is the way of salvation, all of these things have a bearing and a relationship to God's saving work. And once again, Adventism becomes a whole unit. One thing to learn about the Seventh-day Adventist message, you can't pull a piece out and another piece out here and still have an Adventist message. Everything is interconnected. Everything is tied together. It is a unified understanding that we're talking about, and this leads to this. Don't do one other thing. Don't turn this upside down and say, okay, I'm going to do all these things, and then I'll talk about how to be saved. Then we're into legalism. Then we're into grit your teeth and do it right because you've got to do it or else. And this has been a problem in the Adventist church. Let's keep it grace-centered and Christ-centered. But the true grace and the true Christ, that's the issue. There's a false grace and a false Christ. And we've got to know the difference or we're going to be walking down a broad road. Well, what I've done in these two periods now is outline for you two Gospels. What I'm going to suggest to you, and I mean this with all my heart, do not believe what I have said because I have said it. Because a month from now, six months from now, a year from now, someone will come along and share parts of that other gospel with you in a more persuasive way than I am sharing with you today, and you will say, yeah, that sounds good too. Do not believe without evidence. I haven't given you any evidence this morning. I have given you only my convictions. I have defined terms for you. So what we're going to do the rest of this week as we spend these mornings together is going through the evidence. And I'm going to ask you to very seriously make a decision about which gospel you believe is God's way for you based on your own study and your own evidence. And I'm going to be giving you materials that you can take home with you and study for yourself. Because it is not what I say that matters at all. It is what you believe and what God says. That's all that matters. And so I'm going to be sharing, be sharing with you now from here on in why I believe this gospel. I'm going to share with you the evidences that have convinced me. And you'll have to decide what you believe because you have studied it for yourself. So, you haven't opened your Bible so far. We're going to change that. Here and from this point on until the end of our time, we're going to open the Word of God and we're going to see what God says on each one of these subjects. And we'll pray that God will lead us all to the conclusions that will save us for all eternity.